praise the Lord. Now, I'm, uh, I've been a Christian for quite some time. I'm 46 year old. I, mean, I don't look it, but I definitely am 46 year old. I gave my life to the Lord when I was 12. Uh, I was baptised in water on a, this is the same year. and baptised in the Holy Spirit in the same year. I was 12 year old. I gave my life to the Lord and there was, when I, the man who, who prayed for me, he told me at a young age that I was going to be a, a pastor at age 12. Thank the Lord that I had a, if you like, a prophecy or a prophetic words. And at age 19, that come true. I went forward into ministry. And in 21, uh, at age 21, I think, 21 or 22, I can't remember. 20, 22, went forward into ministry. And for all these years, we've served, I've served the Lord. All these years, it's, it's not, not been easy. Sometimes it's been really hard. But for the last... Two, probably in the last three or four years, what I want to talk about, I want to talk to us as a church, and I want to talk to us not about ghost stories, I want to talk to us about spiritual warfare. I don't want to talk to us about, um, I was walking down the road late one night and something jumped out at me and what I'd done, I rebuked. That's, that's not where, if you think that that is what, where we're at with this, with spiritual warfare, I don't want to go down that road. I want to talk to us in a way that the Lord has opened my eyes up to something. And I'm going to fill you in if I've got a few hours to do a Bible study here. So I'll, I'll tell you what happened to me and what was happening in our church. I was, um, I pastored with uh, Brother Joseph. He's a little bit bigger than me. Not by much by it now, but he's a little bit bigger than me. He sings, you probably, you know who he is. And Joseph was... We was in church, and he was suffering at the time, and he, was said, he said to me, Charles, I just can't put my finger on what's going on with me. I just can't figure out what's going on. He said, it's like my mind's not my own, and it's like it's being run by every single horrible, nasty, wicked thought, and I can't keep control of my own mind. It's like it's running away with me. And I said to him, we, we was in a hall, church hall, we packed the chairs up, stacked them up, the women was in the moat and I said, come on, let's pray. So we prayed. And I said to him, I said, Joseph, I said, the, the Lord showed me that there was something praying against him. And I said, Joseph, I said, I believe there's something praying against you. I believe there's something against you. So we started to pray. And I said, let's ask the Lord to bring us to light. That's just, that's just what we asked. Ask the Lord to bring it to light. Where this is from, Lord, show us. Joseph goes home that night. And like every travelling man has dogs. He was breeding dogs. And his dogs was in a pen out the back. And he was barking. He walked outside, come back from church, walked outside, said to his dogs, lay down. His next door neighbour was there. His next door neighbour under the door, under the back door and said, you're wicked to them dogs. Joseph went, these are outdoor dogs, loves. These are hunting dogs. We take them. These are hunting. This is what they do. They're outdoor. She went, no, I talk to them dogs because I'm a witch. And I talk to these dogs. And what I seen when I prayed, I seen something in the corner, like in his bedroom, on its knees, praying something dark. Well, Joseph lived in a, whatever two houses, it's semi-detached, is it? Two houses together. So his bedroom and her bedroom was only a brick part in them. And he, the woman, when the woman said, I'm a witch, she said, it was like, I got, it something just clicked in my mind and I knew exactly what was going on. He said, and the thoughts that was going through my mind is what she was praying for. She was coming against me and I didn't even realise it. I didn't even know. And it, 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 I can only tell you, brothers and sisters, that that is a reality. It wasn't a, it's not a fairy story. That really did go on. Now, I don't understand sometimes how I know that we belong to the Lord and no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And I, these are the things that I want to talk about today. I want to talk about... With me as well, I had a, a time as a Christian, been a Christian for a long time, but a few years ago, I had trouble sleeping. I was going to bed, going to sleep, like no, nothing, everything was all right. But I don't know the significance of the 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm not going to say it's when witches do this or other people. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but I do know that there was something against me because I would wake up with a complete, utter hopelessness feeling. Like, like, I could, didn't have the will to go on. It was like two or three o'clock in the morning and I felt so alone, so empty 
a phrase. It was like, a, a, I can only, if anybody ever, could ever describe it, it was like a feeling of complete hopelessness. And it wasn't until I started to recognise it and start to pray, and then it started to leave. I felt something, I was gaining ground, but it was only when my eyes was opening, opened up to there are things, there is a spiritual battle that we face. And I was working for a man, and I'll explain this. The church that I got saved in used to sell uh, little Christian books. So all along one wall was all just all Christian books. And um, I've been going now 10, 12 years ago. I was looking at the Christian books, buying the Christian books. And uh, the man's got a hedge all the way around the chapel. And one of the old... Um, People who used to go there used to have a tractor with a ed, like an edge cutter on it. But he used to come in, or stone, stone driver used to mess it all up with this edge cutting thing. And he said to me, Charles, can you cut these edges? I said, yeah, of course I can do that. So I take the job off of them, cut the edges up. So the reason why I tell you that, because this pastor phones me up at the blue. It was, it was 2018 he called me. There was travelling men's horses that was in his back garden. He's got a field that backs onto these that was in his garden. He phones me up and says to me, I've got these horses in my garden, Charles. Don't know who they are. Well, phoned up a couple of boys. Didn't, nobody knew who they was. This is on a Sunday. Thank God be Monday the next day. I said, I'll come and take them. I'll get them out for you. Anyway, the horses went. Goes there. The man says to me, Charles, um, can you fix that fence for me? So we fixed the fence so the horses couldn't come in. And they've messed his lawn up. Smashed it every all bits and pieces up and said to me, Charles, can you fix my lawn for me? I went, yep, no problem, I'll do that. Gets a job. I think this man's a bit of a, a wacko. Do you know when they talk to you? This man's worked with a man called Derek Prince. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of this man. He talks about demonology. I, I do like some things that the man is, but I do think the man's... I think he's gone a little bit... There were some things that I could agree with, but there's some things I wouldn't. Um, but he's worked with him, and this man's telling me all different things that's happened to him when he was on holiday camps and things that he went with Derek Prince. And I thought, this man's just a lunatic. Get this job done and go. He said to me this. He said to me, Charles, have you ever met um, a, 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 a travelling boy called Danny? And I went, um, no. He said, him and his wife, they come to one of the meetings around North London, they got saved. He said, what happened? He come to the meeting and she come there. She walked to the front. The man prayed for her and she fell over. And I went, yeah. He said, and the Lord told me to go and pray for her. He said, so I got up and I prayed for her. And I commanded the spirit of death to come out of her. I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, this man's, yeah, all right, mate. He said, and a load of these, she manifested and a load of demons come out of her. I went, all right, fair enough. No more of it. Friday, packs the tools down. This is Friday, he tells me. I'm off to church. Joseph's mum and dad, their motors broke down. They live in Paddockwood near the church. So they have took the church minibus to Paddockwood High Street. Drives it down. Boy and girl said, oh, we're Christians. Where's your church? Where's your fellowship? Sunday morning, I'm preaching. They've witnessed to this, well, told this boy and girl to come to church. Come to church. I'm preaching. They've come in late. They've sat over in the corner. I've preached, gets up after the meeting, speaks to the man. How did you get saved? He said, well, I'll tell you what happened to me. He said, I looked like getting nine years in prison. He said, and I was a Christian yet a few years ago. He said, and I said to my wife, you know what, we've got to go to church, get prayer. Maybe it'll go well with me in the court case. It Maybe it'll go all right with me. I said, oh, yeah. I said, he said, but I'll tell you what happened to me, he said, and why I've walked with the Lord, he said. My wife went forward that day and got prayer. So oh, yeah. He said, she fell over, he said, and another man come up, prayed for her, and a load of them demon covers, brother, come straight out of her. I went, yeah, all right, fair enough. I never put two and two together. I never thought, this is him, this is them. I never even thought about it. Goes back to my job on Monday. I said, all right, strange. Do a man come there, he got saved. He went, Charles, I told you about them Friday. His wife's name's Lorenza, and she's about as big as this. I sat on the man's wall that we was, we was doing a job in and I couldn't work out what was happening I couldn't work out what was going on I started to pray phoned the boys up said Joseph listen this is the story this is exactly what's gone on 
And I want to tell you something. I believe that the Lord was trying to open my eyes to something. He was trying to open me up that this man's not a complete div. This man might have things that we don't agree with, but he's not a complete div at the same time because there is a real spiritual battle. The real, we do live in a real spiritual world. Who can tell me what to be born again is? Born again of what? What are we born again of? What are me and you born again of? Flesh gives birth to flesh. The spirit gives birth to spirit. So there is a spiritual world, isn't there? We as Christians, we want to make it all touchable, don't we? If we can touch it, we can taste it, we can see it. Air Christianity becomes a, a physical thing. But Christianity isn't a physical thing. Christianity is a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing. (laughs) <laughs> it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Spirit, says the Lord. It's a spiritual thing. God is spirit. And now that we are born again, we have to live. We live in a, a spiritual, if you like, world. I, I, if I got a prayer or an answer to a prayer here, it would be that, Lord, when the prophet Elisha prayed, and he said to his servant, he said, open the eyes of my servant that he might see. Sometimes I think if our eyes was open, I wonder... I know there's chairs and human beings and carpet and everything in this building. But I wonder what else we'd see in here. Is not God with us? Is it, is it, does he not come in? Because if he's not welcome here, then we shouldn't be. We're, we're his children. The, the, the Lord is in this place. And then the Lord started to show me. The Lord started to do a work in my life, if you like, to... To help me to have a different understanding, a more of an understanding. In, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. It talks about our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom to devour. We believe in the word of God. I trust in the word of God. I, I believe that I'm teaching this today to Christians who believe in the word of God. When the Bible talks about our adversary, it means an opponent, someone who is against us. And when it talks about our adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, I want you to think about something there. There isn't many animals got killed by the roar of a lion. By the mouth of a lion, plenty of animals, get ki- they get killed, don't they? It puts its teeth around its throat and it kills it. But why the roar? Why does it talk about the roar of a lion? Why the roar? Well, here, the roar of a lion, it brings fear. Have you ever been to a zoo and you heard a lion roar? It's it's, it's got a vibration to it. It's not just a noise. There's a vibration that comes with it. And you're thinking, how ever does that animal do that? There is the roar of a lion, lion. And the roar of a lion, all the roar does here is bring fear. Fear. That's what the lion does. It brings fear. Fear is a tool that the enemy uses to Christians. Fear is something that is more spiritual than what you really understand. Later on, we're going to talk about Elijah. What, what happened to him? We think Jezebel spoke to him. Oh, Jezebel, and he ran. That was more spiritual than what we give credit for. We had nothing to fear from that woman. Nothing at all. When our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, it's just a screaming noise to bring fear into the hearts of Christians. Fear and worry, anxiety... Do you know, when Jesus taught, he told us not to have fear, didn't he? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And as Christians, I find it troubling that we have more Christians that are feared of the devil than they are of God. There's a major problem there. It's like, we, 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 it's like a ghost story. Travelling people, we loved them, didn't we? When I was a little boy, you'd tell a ghost story. It was like, and it's like it set a fear in our lives. It's like we've got a fear for... God, God is so much bigger than the enemy. <laughs> so much bigger than the enemy. We think sometimes it's, an, it's a battle between good and evil. You know, Satan could win and God's there and it's like, could over. That's not, that's not true. God goes, Satan disappears. That's the end of it. He's not, that's it. Gone. But we have Christians who have got more fear over the enemy. Oh, I don't want to know. I don't want to see it. We get spooked out. Do you? There are demon-possessed people. They are. Ed, do you know what we do with a demon-possessed person? We're told to pray for them, deliver them, bring them into the church, into fellowship. Tell you what happens to us because we're so feared. If somebody manifested in church, we'd say, put them out of the building. 
get them out of the way. We ain't told to do that. We're told to reach them. When Jesus went into places, he healed the sick. And what else did he do? Cast out the demons. If, if we had Mary in our church, we would probably say, pack her, don't even talk to her. You never know, this woman's head might spin all the way around. And it's a film, it's a movie, it's something. Do you remember when, the, um, when Jesus sent the, the, the disciples out? What did they come back rejoicing? They come back rejoicing that demons obeyed them. And he said to them, do not rejoice over demons, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because their names being written in the Lamb's Book of Life is so much bigger than anything that the enemy can do. Our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Think about David and Goliath at the minute. What was Goliath doing? He was just a big noise on the top, well, in the valley. I always said top of an hill, but it was in a valley. He was just a big noise in the valley, shouting and screaming. That's all he was. He was just a big noise, wasn't he? I'm going to kill you, I'm going to wipe you all out. That was, what was, that was what Goliath was. He was just a big noise. And when they give ear to it, it put fear into the heart of people. It put fear into the hearts of people. And it wasn't until a little boy come along. And that he was able to withstand it because he knew that he wasn't there. He knew that he was under the power of the Almighty God. He had, a, had an ability because he, he knew that he was strengthened by the Lord. How did David become a great man? How was David this good man? Because he was faithful in an ordinary thing, wasn't he? He was faithful like, uh, I've gone and took the, the, the lambs out the mouth of lions. I've gone and subdued and chased them down and killed them. I've done that. And that's an ordinary thing to do for a shepherd at that point. Because if a lion takes one of your cattle, it won't stop until all the cattle's gone. If any man that has kept chicken, a fox that will come into your chicken coop, it don't take one and disappear, it kills the full lot. So when these, David would have knew that, so if this lion's come and take one of his sheep, he knows he has to go and subdue it. But it was the, the doing the ordinary. It was David that he was a man, it was just a shepherd boy. But when he knew something that was abnormal, he could deal with it. Because he knew that he was a man of, if you like, who could take care of things. The Bible says in John 10.10 10, that our thief comes to kill, steal and destroy. We have something that is against us continuously. And I think as Christians we don't realise it. I think it can be as simple as that if you've got to step out and do something for the Lord, do you not face utter devastation in them, them times? Say like you've been asked to give a testimony. I can remember when I first asked to give a testimony, it's like the whole world was falling out. I was so nervous and full of anxiety to do it. You've got to lead, you've got to preach, you've got to go out witnessing, you're going to do something for the Lord. You face a trial that day. You face it, someone says to you, someone says to you, can you do this? You're going to serve the Lord. You, you're up against it. Yeah. And I'll tell you what the shame is. Some Christians back down. Do you know, you're just fodder for the enemy. He knows what buttons to push to stop you serving. That's what he does. Right. Yeah. He won't do that, I'll do this. It's simple as this. How many men in here, have you had an argument just before you walking out the door? Maybe your shirt isn't ironed. <coughs> What's going on here? Yeah? Hello. <coughs> Don't worry, I do the sound on the um, convention and I normally get this all wrong as well. <laughs> we can have silly petty arguments. Silly, petty things that we think are just stupid and petty. But it brings us into the house of the Lord in a way that we are disrespectful to the Lord. I know what it's like when I've got to preach and I'm full of anxiety and I've got to deliver a message. And as I'm driving, this don't happen all the time, by the way. And I'll share this. This doesn't happen all the time. Me and my wife do love one another, but I will share this because this is a reality. You're driving along in the motor. She says something. I'm a little bit aggravated. And I say something a bit quick back. And before we get there, we've had an argument on the way to get into the church. I've got to preach, but she's got to listen to an hypocrite at the same time. That's what, that's what it's like. That's reality, isn't it? That's, that's, 
You, you go and serve the Lord, the whole world turns upside down. It's, everything's just turned... What, what's going on? It can be as simple as uh, your shirt's not iron or you've, you, there's no diesel in the motor. Nobody has the perfect, ch- perfect trip to church, do they? Nobody. Who has a perfect trip? I have a, I have a dream of the perfect, if you like. I mean, dream of the perfect is to wake up of a morning and feel fully refreshed on a Sunday. <laughs> Get fully refreshed... And as I'm laying there, just as I open my two eyes, there's a cup of tea with a bit of toast or a biscuit at the side of me. And the children are all washed ready. I've never seen so many problems with socks. I mean, I've had four children. We could have war over socks because nothing matched. But can you imagine you, you, your children's all washed and dressed and everything's prim and proper and you, your clothes are there and you, you go into the shower and you have a nice shower. Your favourite kind of soap that you're using... Probably a radox foam burst. I quite like that one. So you're having a nice shower. The water's hot. Nobody's used all the water. It's all cushy. You can have a nice wash. It's all good. You put on your clothes. And when you put on your clothes, you look in the mirror. And maybe everything fits you a little bit better than what it did the last time you wore them. Or your clothes look a little bit. And you stood in the mirror and you think, yeah, I don't look too bad. Yeah, that's all right today. You get ready to get into the motor. And your wife says... I had a little bit of money left over from shopping, so I put it in the tank, and you've got half a tank of diesel ready to go to church. <laughs> you think, oh, this is good. You get to church, you turn up, your favourite preacher's preaching, your favourite leader's leading, they're singing all the songs, they've saved you the best seat, they shake your hand. It's the best meeting that you've ever been to. As of yet, that's never happened to me. <laughs> but I do know, I do have a dream like what the best can be. I can, air, air, the way that we live is so, I can find, a, I can lose a £50 note and I'm sick all day over it. I can find a £50 note and I'm happy all day over it. And it's meaningless, isn't it? It's meaningless in that sense. The, there's no perfect way to get to church. There's punches, there's conking, there's screaming, there's shouting. But it's coming into the house of the Lord in a right attitude, with a right manner. And sometimes as Christians, we don't even realise that that's a spiritual battle to walk into these two doors. We don't. We think that that's just, oh, it's just normal, it's just life. Brothers and sisters, sometimes it's not. And it when you've been into this church and you can hear the preacher preaching and you've never took in one word what he said. I think that's spiritual. I think that you can sit in a meeting, go home and then somebody says to you, what did he preach about? And you go, um... I don't know. What, tell me what's gone on there. What, what's just took place? Something's been robbed then, haven't they? Have you done that? Because I've done it. And sometimes I think it's the attitude that we turn up into church. We don't flip a switch when you walk through them doors and go, well, I'm holy now. It's, it doesn't work that way. There has to be the battle that we have to realise when we're at home and get into this place and coming, coming into the house of the Lord and, and bringing ourselves over to the things of the Lord and saying, Lord, let what's there go and I'm here to serve you. And we can come in and worship the Lord. We can give him praise. Here's what I found. Might be Andy. There is a, a spiritual battle. There is a spiritual battle that goes on every one of us Every time in our Christianity. But it's recognising it. It's having an understanding of it. When you read about in Matthew chapter 13. You read about the sower and the seeds. And it said didn't the birds come and and take away all the fruit. When Jesus explains that. Do you know what he says the, the birds was? The evil spirits that come and took. Come and rob fruit. There's nothing worse than a Christian without no fruit. In fact how can they be a Christian? What come and took it? It was the enemy. The enemy wants to rob fruit out of our life. Peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control. We face a real enemy. We face a real battle. We get saved and we don't realise we go to war. In a minute we're going to talk about, probably the next session we're going to talk about Ephesians chapter 6, about the armour of God. Who do you put armour on? Who wears armour? I thought soldiers wore armour. I think soldiers wear armour, don't they? (coughs) Brothers and sisters, you wear armour. Do you know why you wear armour? Do you know why you wear armour? Because you're in a battle, you're in a war. We need to see someone to the Lord 
we're, what we're doing them when we're telling them someone gets saved in this place, what would be the first three things that you would tell them to do? Prayer? Church, prayer, and word. Church, pray, read your word. So fellowship, read your Bible, pray. That would be, the first, that would be what you would say, wouldn't it? It's so all you're doing. You're preparing someone for battle, really. You're just saying, look, these are the things that we do. If you don't pray, you're not, it's not going to really work. If you're not reading your word, you don't know where to go on. It's... So you're putting the armour of God on them. And then we try to protect them until they're ready to go to war themselves. Like, that's what we do. So when we think about the armour of God, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, we're in the Lord's army. And sometimes we take, take that cheap. Now, what I want to speak about is that Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's never this way. It's never this way. Arguments that take place, especially in church, are never this way. It's always that way. There's something going on here. Something going on this way. And we have to have an understanding as Christians now, as born-again believers, that we have entered a battle. And there's a battle. as continuous, unrelenting. The enemy doesn't give in. When we look at, in Acts chapter 5, we read about two people, Ananias and Sapphira. Two people. Chapter 4, I'll tell you what's just gone on. There's a man called Barnabas. Sorry, kick the wire. There's a man called Barnabas who's just sold a plot of land. And for, as a testimony to everybody, he didn't get the name Barnabas, but he sold everything that he had and brought it into the church so the church should go forward. And he got the name Barnabas from that, the son of encouragement. And Ananias and Sapphira come in and say, we'll do the same. We'll sell a piece of land. But what we'll do, we'll caca. We'll we'll use a bit of craft and we'll keep a part of the money for ourselves. That's what went on. They wanted the praise like Barnabas got, but wanted to tell lies to do it. That's That's what was going on there. So in Acts chapter 5, when it tells about Ananias and Sapphira, Peter would say to them, How has Satan so filled your heart? Now, what is he saying there? Is that just a a flippant way that he's saying? Is that just something that he's just, there was no meaning behind it? No, there was a meaning behind it. Satan had so filled their heart that they'd become deceitful, that they'd become cunning. They wanted something that somebody had envious. It was like all the sin of the world that come upon Ananias and Sapphira. They see their brother getting a nice praise. They wanted it. It was envious of it. Prideful set in. And they, they'd done something that was wrong. And I thank God that God doesn't deal with us like he dealt with Ananias and Sapphira. I'm, I'm gracious for that. I'm thankful for God's grace in that. i tell you what I do know. I'm not no the next day the church the next Sunday they met or the next day that they met with the church times was gonna be bang on the money and everybody was gonna do everything right. But you understand there that these people was Christians and Paul would say, or Peter would say, sorry, how has Satan so filled your heart? How has Satan so filled your heart? Jesus gets goes into the wilderness where he gets tempted. Jesus gets tempted, uh, tested by Satan, if you like. He's there and Satan, turn this rock into bread, throw yourself off, give you all this if you worship me. And Jesus would say to him, get thee behind me, Satan. The next time that you hear Jesus saying, get thee behind me, Satan, because the Bible says that Satan left him for a more opportune time. And the next time you see Jesus saying, get thee behind me, Satan, you know who he's talking to? Peter. Now, I'll put this out there to everybody so that you all have an understanding. I don't believe Peter was demon-possessed. I don't believe a Christian can be demon-possessed. I think that's just just a stupid way of dealing with it. But I do believe that a Christian can be influenced by the enemy. I do believe that there is an influence that can go on. And it's unchecked, unchecking our Christianity. When we don't check our our, our prayer life or the way that we're going, even sin in our life, we have to keep that checked when Peter here, he was in Luke's account, you read, it, you read in Luke's account that he's saying, you're the son of God, you're the one, and God has revealed this to you. As Jesus would say, God revealed this to you, not man. And then, then very, very, if you like, a few verses later, Jesus is saying, this is what I must do. I'm going to go here, I'm going to be handed over, I'm going to be persecuted. And then and, and Jesus says that, and Peter gets up and says, surely not, no, I'm not having this, you ain't doing it. It sounded good, didn't it? It sounded like the right thing, but it was wrong. Jesus would say to him, get thee behind me, Satan. 
So Peter heard, he heard from the Lord at one point, but the enemy spoke to him as well when he heard from the enemy. Peter didn't distinguish between the two, did he? He didn't realise which one was what. Surely if he knew this was God that spoke to him that Jesus is the son of God, and then he would go, but Satan's told me this, so I won't... No, he didn't know. He didn't distinguish between the two. That's why it's right and proper for us to have a right understanding of the word of God so that God will, we understand when God's speaking to us. God doesn't go against his word. He magnifies his word above his name. This is what the word of God's for. So brothers and sisters, we need an understanding of the word of God so that we can distinguish when the enemy's talking and not. That's why sometimes we, people get a, oh, I feel, I feel like the, this is happening, or I feel like that's, that's why we're told we can test every spirit. We test them. I'll share, share this with you, and I wasn't going to use it, but I'll share this with you now. We have so much, sometimes we have a lot of emphasis on speaking in tongues. I speak in tongues. I want the speaking of tongues in their church. I want the interpretation in their church. I want that. We want that in their church. But I think we get so carried away with the speaking in tongues. What about distinguishing between spirits? What about the words of wisdom, words of knowledge? What about that that we're hungering and thirsting for? Prophecy. I want prophecy in our churches. I want these things to take place. We want everybody to speak in tongues, stand up and someone interpretate it. But brothers and sisters, it says desire the more earning or the better gifts, if you like. Prophecy is better. These things are better. So for us, we need to, to be prayed up so that we can be effective in these areas. But we have to have an understanding of well as God, of God's word. But we have to understand that Peter one minute is quoting from God and then the next minute is quoting from Satan. And we have to have that same understanding that where we can go, Lord, I believe this is of you and I need to trust and walk in it. Or Lord, I don't believe this is you. Don't let my mind be carried away by this rubbish. Peter, it happened too later on, you're going to read about Peter. And Peter was such a character, like when Jesus asked him to pray, 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 and he's like myself. I think, I don't know about you, but I think that's spiritual as well. I can watch a film, all, I'll watch a film at two o'clock in the morning. I can't pray for ten minutes with my head on a pillar. I think prayer is the best sleeping pill ever invented. <laughs> Come on. Let's not have me do all the talking. Is that not fact or what? Do you struggle? If your head's on a pillar, can you pray? But then why do we give him that time then? You know you can't do it. You know you're going to fall asleep. And then Peter, Jesus would speak to him later and said, Satan's asked to sift you like wheat, Peter. Sift you like wheat. I wonder if Satan's asked that of any of us here. So it wants to sift us like wheat. Possible, isn't it? I hope it's possible. I want to be that. I want to be that new church. I want to be what Peter, where they, them boys was. And we want. I, I want to tell you something about what I believe about our mission. We've for years we've said like, oh, the enemy wouldn't be against us. We like, oh, there's plenty of other people. We're, do you do realise that we're a part of the biggest growing revival, or the biggest growing work in the world at this present point in time? And if the enemy isn't going to attack us, then who is he going to attack then? It's time for us to wipe ourselves down and go, you know what? We have to understand that there is an enemy, that he does not want us to serve the Lord. He does not want us to go on in the Lord. He does not want us to serve him in any way. I do not believe that there's any person in here who's saved just to sit in a chair and not serve the Lord. I don't believe that. I believe that everybody has got a job to do, good works laid up for them, the Bible says, and that we have to walk into them. So what does the enemy want to do with that? Tell me what does the enemy want to do. If the enemy can't stop you being saved, he can definitely stop you serving. Definitely stop you serving. Now understand something. Understand, is the reason why you don't serve the Lord, is the reason why you are not doing what the Lord wants you to do. Is there a reason behind it? If you chase that reason back, you'll see the enemy in it. 100% you'll see the enemy in it. In 1 Kings 19, when you read about Elijah, 1 Kings 19, chapter 4, when... um, Elijah had done everything that he had done. He killed the prophets of Baal. He's run 18 miles. He's prayed for rain. started to rain. He's done all this. Jezebel comes there. 
Remember the old song, if there ever was a bat out of hell, it was her, Jezebel. And Jezebel was said to him, and spoke, surely by this time tomorrow, I will do to you as what you have done to my prophets. I'm going to kill you. And then he runs. He runs in fear. He runs with that fear again. Takes himself in the middle of nowhere. What does he want? What, is he, what did he ultimately want? I wish I was dead. The woman's going to kill him, so he runs for it. Then he runs to the wilderness and says, I wish I was dead. Well, let the woman kill you then. What do you wish? He didn't wish that that much, did he? Stay there then, let the woman do what she said. But he's run in fear, he's run and he's put himself in a place, he's put himself in a, in a wilderness, he's done something, he's run in fear. Can you not see how the enemy, the enemy's playing ground for all of us is here? It's mental. There is, a men, there is something that the enemy does here and fear is a part of what he does. Christians that live in fear, in worry and anxiety... We see our young people, young people suffer with anxiety now. Young people suffer with anxiety. Young people suffer with depression. Now, I'm not saying all depression is of the enemy. I'm not saying that. I think there is a physical side to it that, that you, can have, uh, you can have medication for it and it can help that. And I'm not trying to say all depression and all anxiety is demonic. I'm not trying to say that. But as a Christian, I know that there are parts of it that is that people put themselves under <coughs> oppression. That the enemy brings fear. When he brought fear into this man, off he goes, off he runs. Sits himself in the middle of a wilderness, wanting to die. Want, I've had enough, can't take it no more. Have you ever said, have you ever said, there's got to be an easier life than this? For you as Christians, have you ever said, there's got to be an easier life than this one? Look at the world runs. Look at what the world does. Look how good they are. Look how good they got it. How foolish are we when we think about that? Is it, uh, Psalm 73. Yeah. Oh, I look, how all my foot almost stumbled when I look at the, the prosperity of the wicked. And it wasn't until I come to my senses and come to the house of the Lord that I realised what was going on. And brothers and sisters, we need to come to our senses. Amen. The beautiful thing about fear is how did God restore Elijah? He just went to him, come get me presents and we'll deal with all this. How do we deal with it? Come get in the Lord's presence and we'll deal with all this. When Peter, when Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God is not given us a spirit of fear. Fear doesn't have to reside here. All fear is not of the, fear for me is not from God. Now, the beginning of wisdom is what? Who can tell me? beginning of wisdom is what? Fear of the Lord. That's a healthy fear. There's a, there's a, I have a healthy fear of the Lord. But that being afraid of what might take place. Do you know, when the Bible says, if I make my bed in the stars, if I could get a rocket ship and I could go to the outermost part of the universe, right at the very edge, and make my bed there, land a rocket on the furthest most planet, God is able to reach me there. He says, if I make my bed in the depths of the ocean and go to the bottom, get in a submarine and sink to the bottom of it all, and I'm able to cry out to the Lord, he's able to reach me there. Do you know what that tells me? There's not a place that God can't help me. There's not a place that God can't reach me. Fear does not have to reside in this body. It doesn't. I have no need for fear, anxiety and worry. That is a tool that the enemy uses to keep you pinned in. We have nothing to fear. What would... Um, how would David write this? They, though I walk for the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. How would David do it? Brothers and sisters, when you read about all the old uh, uh, brothers and sisters in the word of God, they all suffered in this area. The enemy come in, he brings fear, they start to panic, get afraid, want to run away, want to try and fill their lives with other things. And it doesn't need to be that way. We do not have to fear because God has not given me the spirit of fear. I can pray here right now and say, when I'm afraid, Lord, that is not from you. I don't want it. I'm not receiving that. I'm not having worry. I'm not having anxiety. I don't have to do with it. I'm not trying to belittle anybody. I'm not trying to make anybody feel uh, low in themselves because I'm saying that that's, that's not of the Lord. But I'm telling you the truth. I don't see it in scripture where we're told to have fear. And the only fear that we're told is to fear the Lord. That's it. 
Everything else I've not done after it. Worry has torture with it, doesn't it? it has, when you're worried and full of anxiety, it has a torment with it. We're not saved to be tormented. We're not. He set us free from it. We need to be set free from things like this. And there, this might be going a different way than you thought. You might have come here for a different meeting. You might have wanted me to talk about in a dark world where it was all dark and it was all... This is reality. This is the reality for me and you of spiritual warfare. Isn't walking out and laying hands on somebody and seeing demons come out. That's not it. I'm going to teach you how to overcome it. I'm going to teach you how to hold first with it. Hold fast with it. The first part of this, when I talk about spiritual warfare, is to tell brothers and sisters that they're in a real battle. It's real. It's not false. It's not fake. It's not, it's not oh, it's a way with the fairies. It's a real thing. We face a real battle. Real, every single day of our life, we face a real battle. Every day. And it's up to us to overcome this. The next, next part I want to talk about... What's, how long have we been going? 40 minutes. Sorry. The next part, we'll have a break. We'll do the next part. And I will talk about how we're to hold on. How we are to, to stand firm in the things of the Lord. And then how we're over to come all this. Amen. Let's pray.